Mayhem Devil binding the old gods and claim the firstborn in the opener here for Santos. Yeah. <laughs> well, that told you all you needed to know about that hand. And this <laughs> seems like Santos heard you, Marnie, because that one got sent back into the deck and we are looking at a six that uh, at least has a trail of crumbs to get some early card advantage going and a couple of copies of Binding of the Old Gods, which line up pretty nicely against that Yashan that I see uh, Elon Flock has found. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad Bernardo came to the exact same conclusion as me. I'm sure if we had player mics, we would have heard the same guttural noise come from his mouth as came from mine. I'm sure you're right, Marnie. <laughs> so you see, oh, a nice growth spiral here on turn number two for Ivan Flock. The dream curve growth spiral into Yashar, and that is exactly what this deck is designed to do is explore or grow spiral good curve from bernardo as well has those two copies of binding the old gods still needs to find a fourth land in order to turn them on but bernardo has a chance to potentially keep up with this draw if he's able to go binding yashar and binding nissa yeah those two copies of binding ready to answer the big uh, threats that Ivan flock has found already but, you know, it's not trivial to find the lands. Right? You're thinking about, you know, there's a trail of crumbs on the battlefield. Surely you could just cycle through. But without something like a goose uh, or without an oven to get this cat reliably into the graveyard, it can be pretty difficult. Um, and especially with the Ashan and Packable Earth coming down, essentially, you know, stopping that trail of crumbs from being able to do its thing. Yeah, fortunately, Bernardo, not having to worry about that, will be taking four damage here uh, if Yvonne opts to attack, which uh, he likely uh, may choose not to, just because recognizing as long as Yasharn stays on the battlefield, he will be uh, good. But I guess with the Nissa, he'll want to put the pressure on, attack with everything. The cat going in the graveyard is awkward, as it, it can chomp, binding comes down, and then it can be returned for an easy trail activation. But mm. this is the type of thing where even if Bernardo has the binding here on the Yashard and then on the Nissa, it, the damage will be done. There will be two, three, three, four us in play just continuing the pressure. And looking as well forward a few turns, that Shark Typhoon, often you might think a card like Shark Typhoon not so good against uh, these kind of ground creatures, you know, pinging damage strategies. But when you have enough lands on the battlefield, that is going to close out a game pretty quickly as well. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Binding on Nissa here rather than Yasharn, just because uh, Bernardo feels like Nissa is going to do a lot more damage if it stays on the battlefield for an extra turn. Binding does, in fact, target Nissa. She is going to get destroyed, and oof, there's the Hydroid Crisis. So, a really smart play there by Bernardo, taking out that mana advantage for, for Flock. Yeah, Bernardo facing down 7 damage here, going to 9. Yvonne has the option of just passing the turn with Shark Typhoon represented. That will give him 7 uh, points of damage if Binding does come down on the Yasharn during Bernardo's next turn. That would pres at least keep him somewhat safe from something like a claim the first form plus sacrifice outlet if there is one but again first the yasharn has to be gotten rid of so it Yvonne really presenting a nice multi-pronged attack against what bernardo is doing here shark typhoon ready to be cycled growth spiral as well as a, a hydrate crisis for later on and this bant list, money it's very strange because these are all cards that we've seen before. We saw them in Standard. We've seen, we've even seen this bant mid-range, bant control, floating around Historic, sometimes playing cards, you know, like Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. But it's very interesting to see this deck kind of re-emerge at this late stage in the metagame. Yeah, I think going into the Kaltheim Championship and beyond, many players were thinking about what the best shell to put Yasharn in is. And it, it seems like for at least some players, including this Czech team, the conclusion they landed on was this specific build of bad midrange just because having access to seven or eight ways of playing that uh, Yasharn on turn three was the exact boost they needed to uh, 
make the deck viable. And with that draw of the Nissa now, Yvonne has lethal next turn through a binding. Yeah, things could not have gone better here for Ivan Flock in game number one. Santos is going to be able to get another land out of the library and remove one of these threats, but it's just not going to be enough. Nyssa makes a land, and that land has pseudo-haste, as it were, since it can attack immediately. Santos tapped out at nine... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I the see. Cute win. <laughs> what are you going to do it the fun way? <laughs> but there, there's a Cauldron's Familiar on the other side, so Yvonne missed it. Oh, this is, this oh. is not lethal. Uh, you see Yvonne shaking his head after. He, he went for the cute play, as it were, and getting heavily punished for it. So <laughs> it, this game isn't necessarily over now. Ivan well, Flock maybe falling prey a little bit to the classic FPS fancy play syndrome. But still in a commanding lead here with a Hydra Graces in the air that's lethal and a Forest and Kahira on the ground that together present lethal. Is there much that Santos can do? There technically is. I think what Santos needs to do is if he's able to bring the Cauldron Familiar, he has to play Trail of Crumbs, bring back Cauldron Familiar, activate the uh, trail to find something like a Phyrexian Tower or a Witch's Oven. Uh, that would put him in a position where he can claim the Firstborn, the Krasis, and sacrifice it, have the Cauldron Familiar as a blocker for the forest, and at least in his eyes, he would stabilize against this board. The Nissa who shakes the world in Yvonne's head will still end the game, uh, based on what we currently see, but that is Bernardo's, is Bernardo's only hat out to try to survive this turn. Alright, well, here's step one, Trail of Crumbs. Cauldron Familiar coming back onto the battlefield, that's step two. And it looks like it was just a crag crown pathway off the top. That is not going to do it all, and a corvold as well. But it is too little too late here in game number one for Bernardo Santos. And it looks like Ivan Flock, this deck that they brought specifically to take down this uh, type of matchup, is going to do the job required. It looks like we may be getting a restart from Ivan here. Uh, just a little technical issue here for Ivan Vlog in the client to sort out. I'm sure we'll be back on shortly. All right, just while we're getting the players sorted out for that um, for that game, Imani, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about this being the best shell for Yashan. What are some of the other options that players can have if they want to utilize the big pig? Uh, one really fun and perhaps still powerful option is the five color niv mizzet deck that we saw uh mike sigris and peter Gloglausi bringing to the uh caltheim championship we have seen uh essentially azorius control decks that are more counter spell heavy just flashing for yasharn we've also seen decks like bat angels uh have it as a powerful sideboard option all right well Thanks for that rundown, Manny, and uh, you you are so good at this in that you talked for precisely the amount of time we needed <laughs> as we see Ivan Flock uh, finish off that game number one as we look at the sideboard. So what can Jun do to fight back against that? Uh, it's really hard. The Noxious Grass will help. They answer Krasis, they answer Yashard, they answer Nissa. So Noxious Grass, one of the best cards in the sideboard, but the best thing this Bernardo gets as an upgrade here is the full four copies of Thoughtseize sitting in a sideboard. Those will play a very important role in coming in, replacing some of the more questionable cards like Claim the Firstborn here. We did see Bernardo with two copies of Claim in his hand at the end of that game and wasn't able to ever really put together a sacrifice outlet, didn't have the time he needed to cobble together his entire game plan. So it, certainly I think Thoughtseize and Noxious Grass will uh, help a decent amount. Uh, we are getting a look at how the players sideboarded. Uh, Bernardo is bringing in two Noxious Grass, four Thoughtseize and an Epic Downfall makes sense to me mm -hmm. 
and uh, let's see what Ivan Flock is doing. Oh, it looks like the Aether Gusts are coming in. Three copies out of the sideboard and uh, just going to side out a few of these more awkward removal spells. I think one copy of Wrath of God and two Baffling and Let's go down to the game number two and see if Bernardo Santos can switch it up and claw it back. Oh, there's that Thoughtseize in hand for him right at the start, along with Epic Downfall, Mayhem Devil, and Binding the Old Gods. Yeah, this is a good hand, uh, especially with him being on the play. He doesn't have to go particularly fast, considering he doesn't have a two drop, so he can just wait, play the Thoughtseize on turn two to get a better look at this hand. And uh, for Yvonne, Lots of great cards. There's certainly going to be a choice for Bernardo and what to take. I think the Explore will look very tempting just because it slows down Yvonne's game plan. The Ether Gust is the premium sort of interaction Yvonne has. I would guess the choice is likely between the two of them. Hmm. Oh, looks like it's actually going to be Shark Typhoon that gets taken away. Uh, maybe thinking a little bit ahead to um, the future. Marty, why would you take Shark Typhoon here? Yeah, I think part of the reasoning for that is uh, when you've taken out Claim the Firstborns, even though your opponent may not know that, uh, post-board you don't have as many answers to a shark, and you do have access to something like Binding the Old Gods if the opponent decides to hard cast it, but if they just make a token, well... Your bindings are already being overloaded by some of the other cards that this deck is presenting. So taking the threat that you may have difficulty answering makes a lot of sense from Bernardo's position, considering he's not being too proactive either right now, and he doesn't really care about the reactive cards from Yvonne at the moment. Yeah, talking about not being too proactive, doesn't even get that Mayhem Devil down on three, instead choosing to put Gigantha the Wellspring in hand. I guess Mayhem Devil isn't doing that much when they're on, uh, you know, sacrifice synergies to be exploiting. Yeah, knowing that the Baffling End is in Yvonne's hand also plays a part in that. If you're just playing Mayhem Devil into that Baffling End, it, what you're basically saying is, I just want to get this out of your hand. That's not really what Bernardo is in the market for at the moment. Not when he has the opportunity to go something like Thoughtseize this turn and then maybe clear the way for that Baffling End. For that mayhem double, so, I mean. So Ivan Flock is actually going to commit this thought sees away, put it back a couple of cards deep. And that does leave the way open here for Mayhem Devil to you know potentially come down, but there is that baffling end still in hand, and Santos not really left with a lot of powerful things to do right now. Yeah, that was Yvonne protecting his Hydroid Crisis, recognizing that if the Thoughtseize goes second from the top, Bernardo won't have access to it next turn, which buys Yvonne the time he needs where if he draws another land, he would be able to play the Hydroid Crisis for X equals 4 before Bernardo draws that Thoughtseize again to try to take it. It looks like it is going to be Mayhem Devil now. Oh, and there is Yashan, Implacable Earth. Where did we land on whether this was a big pig? Uh, it's the medium pig. It's the medium pig, gotcha. Yes. And race forerunners is the big pig. <laughs> okay, that does make sense. That is a much bigger pig. <laughs> the pig classifications of Magic the Gathering. Yeah, I, I, maybe we should get some, some of our friends to make a pig tier list. <laughs> okay, before you all cancel me for making tier lists. We're going to see Flock get that fifth land down, just as you say, Marnie, and uh, in time to line up a crisis for four next turn. Back over to Santos, who is going to use this epic downfall to exile that Yashan, make it go away forever. Yeah, that it, it's a start, but... Yvonne has the crisis here. This is the rebuild. There is an answer for it from Bernardo's side. He does have a pretty decent turn to kind of try to clean this up. Thoughts he's first, get a look at Yvonne's hand, figure out if the coast is clear, follow that up with binding. Uh, from Yvonne's side, he may be tempted to go for something like Baffling and leave up Ether Gust here, but knowing that Thoughtseize exists on Bernardo's uh, top of his library, he's just going to want to play the Hydra Crisis this turn and not expose it to that Thoughtseize. That was the entire game plan from him. Yeah, Thoughtseize really 
the only clean answer to something like a hydroid crisis, you know, that has that uh, very powerful cast trigger. And we are going to see that thought seize now this turn. And, you know, Marnie, I know the Jun deck hasn't had the best draw. It's been a little bit slower than usual. We haven't seen a lot of cap oven action, but this just seems like a nightmare matchup for Jun food. It, it's really rough. And, you know, you talk about the cat oven synergy, but it, it's not even something that Bernardo feels like is the optimal thing to be doing in the matchup. He takes out a copy of Cauldron Familiar in the matchup. It, it, it's one of those things where the cards Yvonne is playing just line up so well against this Jun deck that you're sort of scrambling to put together a new game plan in a deck that really only has one game plan. Yeah, and John had been such a dominant force ever since Uro was um, removed from Historic. You know, people were saying, oh, the format solved, John, this is it, cat oven. We're going to go all the way. But we're still seeing innovation, you know, six, seven weeks into this, this standard form, this Historic format. Yeah, I, I think players are just, with the Sultai Ultimatum deck, for example, players are just demonstrating what is possible when you have a format that is this large with a card pool this deep and just more time. Between the release of Caldheim and the Caldheim Championship, I just don't feel like there was enough time for the optimal build of a complicated deck like uh, Sultai Ultimatum to be found in Historic. And I think that applies to many archetypes. We continuously see more cards added to Historic. We're going to see more with the Mystical Archives coming out in Strixhaven. Mm. Uh, and I don't think all the optimal builds of certain archetypes will get found immediately. So it's one of those things where it, maybe there won't be a good Storm deck in the first week of post-Strixhaven Historic. But th there may be the cards for a good Storm deck in the sixth week. It'll just take some time for the players to find that build. I'm so excited about Mystical Archive. I'm so excited. Brainstorm in Historic Faithless Looting Storm. I cannot wait until the the first, you know, big showcase event after those cards hit uh, hit the arena decks. All right, so we have here a bit of a situation, a bit of a holding pattern, where Yvonne Flock has the board under control. There's Little to nothing going on on the side of Santos. You know, there is a, a Colossipede down on the battlefield at Gigantha the Wellspring. Um, but Ivan Flock has Aethergust, you know, and is still working with 15 life, so plenty of time to really find an answer to a 5 5. Uh, and we we saw previously when Andre Strasky had the same kind of holding pattern against. Um, Palavita Zamada Rosa, where he was just really looking for that one big top deck to to finish it off. And is that the same situation we're seeing here? Yeah, more or less. Uh, for Yvonne, the big top deck right now would be Narset. If he finds the Narset to combine with that memory, the game is all but over. For Bernardo, the biggest top decks that he can find are something like a Corvold, which uh, post-board he only has three of in the deck, or something like Trail of Crumbs. We do see Yvonne has that negate ready for Trail of Crumbs. I wouldn't be surprised for him to just take the damage here and save the Aether Gust for the end step, just to make sure he's not exposing himself to exactly that card. Luckily for him, it is just going to be a Cauldron Familiar. And in the end step, actually just going to cycle away the Scatter Grove, and there she is! Narset, Parter of Veils. Does he have enough mana to do everything? Just! <laughs> He has enough to do it all this turn, but he wouldn't be able to Aether Gust at 9 life. I think that's too risky. I think we're going to see Narset now, Aether Gust on Bernardo's turn, and then Memory next turn while he's able to uh, essentially have the board clear of threats, Ooh. as well as have Negate up. And a backup Narset now in hand. The door is closing. That sliver of light is getting narrower and narrower for Bernardo Santos. Yashad... <laughs> Attacking in. Yeah, that's confidence right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know when this pig comes swinging in, you know that uh, something bad is going to happen to your Gigantha. Yeah, uh, Yvonne making it well and clear that uh, this is not a board state in which he's feeling uncomfortable. 
passing the turn, we okay, maybe we'll see this Aether Gust now. We sometimes tend to see this in the draw step occasionally. The downside of letting Bernardo on tap with Gigantha is Bernardo has access to some extra mana, but realistically, given how flooded Bernardo already is, the extra mana isn't going to be the biggest difference maker here. Uh, and letting uh, Bernardo draw first and then tucking the Gigantha further, uh, just so they don't have another threat to develop into your memory turn, I think serves you really well here. Trail of Crumbs was the fine for Bernardo, but Ivan Flock has all cases covered, has a negate ready in hand for when that trail comes down. Bernardo's just going to ignore Nasa and send these both at the dome. Yeah, he, he's forcing Ivan's hand in that ether gust. He's saying, clearly you have something if you're attacking with Tisharn. I can't do anything about it, so prove that you have it. He has it. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> Here's Aether Gust and uh, Bernardo Santos' face betraying his emotions there, I think, a little bit. And uh, we see Gigantha sent away. Trail of Crumbs is not going to do it from this position. That memory is face up in the graveyard. And negate his face up in the hand. Uh, Bernardo knows about it from an earlier thought sees. That's why he's not just slamming down this trail. He knows it's going to get countered, but he has no choice but to run it in anyways. And for Yvonne, this is just academic. <laughs> negate takes care of trail crumbs. There's just an overgrown tomb in hand. May as well play it out. Some click efficiency. Oh, <laughs> and a hydro crisis for good measure. But it looks like Ivan Flock is not going to need it here. I, I would guess he'll develop that over the memory this turn, just because why not? You'll have a threat. Well, because you you could do the cool combo instead, Marnie. I mean, come on. <laughs> for the clout. <laughs> First, let's go d digging for some sort of counterspell. It would be uh, Ivan's preference here, I would guess. All right, let's see what, what Narset finds. I'm just going to have a little think. Just double checking everything is in order. Gross Spiral, not bad. Can cast Crisis for X equals 5 here, and that would allow him to still, uh, or 4, uh, still be able to cast a counter spell that he finds, unfortunately, wasn't able to do so. But, you know, very safe position here for Yvonne Flock. This attack is going to take Santos down to nine. Oh, maybe Ivan Flock is uh, eyeing up that Kahira <laughs> for the Kahira lethal again, but doesn't need to. Santos packed it up. Ivan Flock taking it down with Bant midrange. And uh, Mani, you and I are storming ahead in this prediction race. <laughs> Yeah, that was just a absolute nightmare matchup for Bernardo Santos. Not what he wants to see uh, at this point in League Weekend. They are in pod B of uh, the Rivals League currently, so both players within grasping distance of trying to make it into that first pod and maybe make a run for a good finish this weekend. But unfortunately, Ivan's deck was just completely ready for what Bernardo was doing. Yeah, uh, Ivan Flock moving up the rankings there a little bit with that extra point gained. And as you say, Mane, trying to put himself in a good position overnight, but not just overnight, you know, maybe thinking about the next league weekend coming up um, in Strixhaven to maybe make a run at it there as well. All right, so we are going to just have a quick look at what is coming up after the break. Uh, it is going to be uh, back to the MPL this time. We are going to pod C to have a look at Li Shi Tian going up against Raphael Levy, both Team Hararuya pros. Li Shi Tian, uh, 25 points in the MPL, and uh, oh, he's brought goblins. Yeah, Lee, a big fan of red decks, as we have seen many times in his past career. And Mono Red Goblins, still one of the most powerful tribal creature decks in uh, in Historic. So it's certainly nothing to uh, sleep on here from Lee. 
And as for Rafael Levy, uh, is this the Gabzan mid-range deck that we saw at the Caldem Championships? I, I, I would guess so. I haven't had a chance to look at the list yet, uh, but I would guess that there's not that many Abzan midrange decks uh, available <laughs> in this historic format. If it is the Gabzan midrange deck, well, that deck is very much targeting Junt. It, it does have some uh, splash damage that does hurt goblins, but for the most part, this isn't the exact matchup you're looking for if you're in Raf Seat. All right. Well, that is going to be coming up after the break. And uh, Mani and I will be back to take you through that one in just a few minutes. So stay tuned. What's up, my friends? My name's Hayo, and I'm here with Mani. We bring you coverage of the April Strixhaven League weekend, and we are about to see um, a little bit of a boss blast from the past. Goblins in the hands of Li Shichen going up against Abzan Midrange, one of the newer kids on the block. And uh, let's have a look at the deck list here between these two players. Li Shichen, just that one lovely red mana symbol. Goblins, Marnie, has this deck changed at all since a few months ago? There's snow mountains now. Uh, Why? Realistically, <laughs> realistically, the primary cards in this deck haven't changed. The biggest inclusion is some copies of Frostbite in the sideboard. That is why the Snow Mountains are there. I, I actually remember as part of the testing for the Calheim Championship, uh, PVDDR sleeved up this Goblins deck, but uh, I, I believe it was PV, but was like, why is there Snow Mountains in here? So he just changed them to regular mountains, and then oh, in no. the first match got paired against a creature deck, went to sideboarding looked at the frost bites in his sideboard and was like ah <laughs> so you know there's snow mountains now okay, short okay. Of that story yeah because when you just look at the the 60 you're like mm, these snow mountains are just for fun but the frost bites in the side uh, do provide the answer to that one otherwise you have your classic uh Marxist goblin grandy based strategy and that one's going to come down and spin the wheel flip a lot of goblins off the top and uh, this version is actually running the Iron Crag feet, so we could be seeing some acceleration into Muxus in very early on, Money. 
Yeah, I think what players have kind of settled on for those who are still playing Goblins as the format is developed is Historic is a high-power format, and if you're trying to keep up with the other decks that are doing these powerful things, either Auras, which are getting off to the races as early as turn 3 once they have a turn 2, uh, Enchantress creature, uh, is you need a big burst to keep up with what they're doing and stay on pace, and Iron Craig Feet is that sort of effect that makes Goblins as explosive, if not more so, than those other decks. All right, well, um, let me just have a look at what's going on with Li Shitian's record. Uh, he's actually already beaten John Food today in Historic, so 1-0 and in Historic so far. Let's have a look at what um, Raphael Levy is working with. And it is Absan Midrange, and this does, in fact, look very similar, if not identical, to the list that uh, a few of the MPL members brought to the Caldam Championships. Yeah, this list, again, very much targeting Jund. We see cards like Kaya or Zav uh very impressive against Jund, not great against uh, the field at large, as it were. Uh, but does have applications in this matchup being a removal spell for specifically uh, Skirk Prospector does still have a lot of value. Uh, the anti-creature cards in the deck serve a purpose. Wall of Blossoms at least able to keep your life total up. Uh, Night of Autumn, especially post ward when your opponent may be looking at bringing in Herald's Horn, that may be a deterrent. The four copies of Thoughtseize in the main deck will be extremely important just to get uh, Muxus out of hand. But you know, this deck isn't playing Wrath of Gods, for example. There's four copies of mm -hmm. Extinction Event, but that card has always been somewhat questionable against Goblins just because their primary problem cards are Muxus and Cranko, who are even-costed. But mm -hmm. if you remove those, you're leaving the Lords, the Chieftain and the War Chief in play. Those are odd. They give things haste. So the next turn, they just rebuild with more haste creatures. So Extinction Event is always a, a very awkward board wipe when it comes to specifically the Goblins matchup, which is one of my big worries for Raph in this matchup. It sounds like, Marnie, what you're saying to me is that if Raph can handle the early creatures in the build-up, he might be able to find some breathing space to get into the late game. But if the Goblins deck gets out onto the battlefield and goes wide very quickly, the Extinction Events are not going to be enough to catch him up. Yeah, I think that definitely sums it up well, with the great asterisk of don't let Muxus come into play. And, well, that may be difficult here for the Absent deck. All right, so we are actually going to join this match in game number two, and I can tell you that Li Shiten with Goblins did in fact win game number one. So we're actually going to come straight in at sideboarding here, Mani. And uh, let's have a look at the sideboards. Oh, there are those four copies of Herald's Horn, and Li Shitian decided to bring in just one of them, as well as a few Goblin Ringleaders and a Gem Palm Incinerator. Yeah, this is not a matchup in which Li needs to go particularly fast. That's why we see the Iron Craig feats come out. He'd rather have more gas uh, in the Goblin Ringleaders. It makes a lot of sense. For Raph, I think his sideboarding really highlights exactly how big of a problem Muxus is against this Abzan deck. Necromentia, a card that mm. usually you do not see come in in a matchup <laughs> uh, that is essentially creature decks. Uh, Raph has to bring it in here just in order to get rid of those copies of Muxus permanently, as his win percentage when his opponent doesn't have a Muxus will go up significantly. And that single copy of Graph Decker's Cage can be a huge headache as well for this Goblins deck. Let's go down to game number two and see whether Li Shitian can close this one out quickly, or whether Abza Midrange uh, will be able to equalize. Oh, double Maze Mind Tome in the opening hand. Just one piece of early removal in Mythos of Nethway. This is not looking necessarily that great for Raphael Levy. Oh no, this is very rough. Unfortunately, there isn't even a black source for that Mythos of Nethroi at the moment. Uh, that pathway that he has available to him is green and white, so Raph needs a lot of help, and on the other side, Lee is not having similar issues. Oh no, this is a, a Stomp <laughs> Skirk Prospector on one. There's a Wily Goblin on two. There's War Chiefs, Goblin Ringleaders, there's a Cranko. What more could you want? 
Yeah, Lee really just has every option available to him, depending on how his draws pan out. Uh, if he's able to draw a third land, can make the choice between playing War Chief or cashing in that treasure early to rebuild off of something like a Krenko or a Goblin Ringleader. So for Lee, just feeling extremely good about his draw, the Skirk Prospector as well in play means that if a Moxus is drawn, he's not too far away. And for Raf, that's a black card. Yeah, really sad to have to put that fatal push underneath. Usually you would want that against this kind of low curve creature deck, but desperately looking for the black mana to turn on this Mythos of Nethroy and eventually the extinction event. Oh, there's a Grafticus cage. Is that helpful? It 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 kind of has to be at this point. I think for Raf, he's recognizing that Yes, goblins is going to attack me from multiple angles. They're all problematic. I'm I'm in a difficult position with my current draw, but if I can stabilize this board and my opponent just plays a Muxus, I'm going to lose anyways. So he takes the Grafdigger's Gage. It's a very speculative pickup, uh, mm -hmm. considering he still does need black mana, and he will probably have to take damage here to play it because he can't afford the Temple loss of Samian for next turn. But he knows he's in trouble. It does have two Maze Mind Tomes going, though, so that can provide quite a few looks at trying to find the black source for that extinction event. Back over to Lee Shi Tian now, and let's see what he can do on this turn. Uh, Lee has access to just playing Goblin Ringleader off the treasure right now. May not want to sacrifice any of his goblins quite yet. The other option, if he wants to perhaps play around a board wipe, is keeping the treasure around and sacrificing the Wily Goblin for mana as a potential option. He can vary his uh, sources of mana that way in case, for example, Raph has a removal spell for the Skirk Prospector. So there's a few interesting choices with what Lee can do here, especially keeping in mind that the uh, impact of his Muxus has been greatly diminished. It looks like it's going to be Goblin Warchief and uh, just getting the beat down on for now. That's Perhaps... Black Source. Oh, it is a Black Source. It is a painful Black Source though, Marnie. And uh, Raphael Levy already going down to 13. It's going to have to go down to 11 to shock this Godless Shrine in. Although... There is a saving grace. Uh, at least one Maze My Tome is ready to pop next turn, recouping four life for Raphael Levy. So assuming he survives through this turn, which given Lee's hand, he likely will, uh, he has access to four more life in that Maze My Tome. All right, so Extinction Event is going to take out the Skunk Prospector um, and the War Chief, leaving just the Wily Goblin, the 1 1, out on the battlefield. As you say, there is a Grafticus Cage out, which is going to stop any Muxus shenanigans, but Goblin Ringleader, of course, will store. still draw some cards here for Li Shitian. Ooh, Goblin Chieftain, a pretty scary pickup there on Lee's side as it, it tells Raph that once again he can expect some hasty goblins uh, on the next turn potentially. And already at 8 life, a virtual 12, he's still in a very scary position. Kaya Oz of Usurper doesn't. is thinking about whether to keep that one or not. She can gain a little bit of life. But. Yeah, you can't really let Kaya. Uh, you can't really let this board go completely unanswered, considering there's a Goblin Chieftain uh, available for Lee. That land costs three mm -hmm. life. Oh, it's just so painful. And that you know is the cost of putting all these fancy cards in your deck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if that was a plane, so you'd be like, sure, I'm gonna keep it, but. Um, you do have to pay a cost for adding these extra functionalities into your deck building. And Amiria's call, that's going to have to be sent to the bottom. You see the upkeep stop there for Raphael Levy, and um, at least he's going to be able to gain four life off this Maze Mountain. 
Yeah, I think what Raph is hoping to do is scry during his upkeep into an untapped land uh, that would allow him with five mana to pass the turn, leaving a Mithro Mythos of Nethroi for something like Goblin Chieftain uh, and still draw a card off of that Maze My Tome if possible. Uh, mm. But now having missed it, this is the awkward situation where uh, he may have to go for like a risky activation of that Maze My Tome to draw a card. If he misses on the land, he has the backup of Wall of Blossoms. If he hits, he's still able to leave up the Mythos. Leaving up Mythos primarily for Goblin Chieftain in case Lee goes for something like that. But again, this is this is risky. Decides to actually go for the Wall of Blossoms first. That's going to draw a card. That is an untapped land money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. The game's back on. Raph was trying very uh, hard not to pay that life, but, you know. Well, he's going to get some of it back. What were we saying about MTG Finance earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Paying two life so you can be alive to gain four life later? That's got to count. And it, uh, it, It's worth it, I guess. <laughs> well, it's worth it to survive here in, you know, round number five of the MPL League weekend. Um, here's Mythos of Nethroid ready to take down a Goblin Chieftain. Can DC yeah. 10 play both the Goblin Chieftain and Krenko? There's not enough mana to do that, right? Not quite. Not this turn. Uh, technically, there is if you play Skirk Prospector and sacrifice every other creature. Uh, but that's pretty risky considering it, that there's a lot that can go wrong in that situation. <laughs> There's a lot that can go wrong indeed. So it is just going to be an attack with the two um, small goblins there. Why the goblin getting through for one? This is going to be another setup turn now with uh, that treasure being made. I just feel like every turn with goblins is a setup turn until the turn that you win. Yeah, part of it is uh, Lee recognizing the Raph is at five life and he has a Castle Emberth in play. He doesn't need to overextend with good creatures when he can put throwaway creatures on the battlefield. He has available to him a Jump Home Incinerator in the hand. He can just use it here to kill off this Wall of Blossoms and essentially try to win the game with this ragtag squad of goblins. <laughs> I love it. Like the plan C slash plan D of, of this goblins deck. I'm just going to put some 1-1s one and 2-2s two out. You're at 5. What are you going to do? Yeah, the B team, as it were, are really being tagged in here. And if, if something goes wrong, then we can start deploying some Krankos. Like the, the junior youth league of the, the Goblins division. Yeah, this here is comes, the Suicide Squad comes. right here. They, they're, meant, they're meant to die in battle. And if they get the job done, well, it's a pleasant surprise. Here is that life game we were talking about before. Here's my time going to pop off and provide four extra life points for Raphael Levy. Not out of the woods yet, but unlikely potentially to die in this coming turn cycle. He, yeah, he has the option available to him to put Yorian in hand here and still leave up Mythos or uh, Maze Mind Tome activation or both should it be necessary. Uh, scary times still ahead as with Castle Emberth and Goblin Chieftain available to uh, available to Lee. There's a lot that can go wrong for Raph. He may not have the luxury of putting Yorian in hand this turn. Might just have to draw a card off of the Maze Mind Tome, hope to find something like it an extinction event but you know this is ugly i think you're right money because not only is there castle Emberth, you know there is that chieftain cranko dynamic that's uh well we know is looming but will be looming large in raphael's mind of course these players <laughs> raphael intimately... knows about the chieftain that was why awkward. right but he doesn't it know is... about the cranko right like so oh of course yeah Everything is okay. looming. <laughs> it's all just looming. What a terrifying thought, the idea of these goblins just kind of haunting you every step of the way. Just sat behind this like, grass cage <laughs> and a wall made of flowers. 
that's a uh i okay all right uh, all the blossoms that's a thought that's a thought okay. <laughs> okay so thoughtsies can take out the goblin chieftain and yep. then it goes down to 11 from this there's the two crankos and he now knows about those <laughs> I think Raf was just dead without that thought he... so that, that's a good draw. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's very weird to think of Thorsies as being the saving draw against something like a, you know, a swarm of goblins, but taking out that, um, <laughs> taking out that haste-giving goblin chieftain is pretty huge here. Although, is Castle Embred still going to get it done? And I guess Wall of Blossoms is going to block the 3-2. Right. So, Castle Embreath is going to keep putting on pressure. Uh, at this point, Lee has enough mana where he can y use some of those tr treasures uh, aggressively. Uh, pushing through 6 damage here, uh, a good reprieve for Lee is knowing that both those Maze Mind Tomes are gone. So Raphael has gained about as much life as he has available to him at this moment. So pushing 5 damage through, keeping your board, and developing a Krenko, still extremely problematic for Raph. Yeah, I'm looking at through Raph's deck list a little bit. There are a couple of copies of Oath of Kaya as well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a copy of Oath of Kaya for Raphael Levy. So still... Clinging on in there. Oath That's of a really important draw. <laughs> it, it was huge. This can deal with the Cranko before it activates. And the gain three life. So that's going to put Raphael Levy back up to eight. <sighs> what a Raph dance. Raphael's seven mana. He's one away from putting Yorian in hand and playing it the same turn. With Oath of Kaya on the battlefield, blinking that is another removal spell and another three life, another card off Wall of Blossoms. Wrath has a route to stabilizing thanks to that Oath of Kaya. Oh my goodness. And we were so negative about the two copies of Maze Mind Tome in the opening hand. We thought, oh, it's going to be way too slow. But that life gain has really meant that Raphael Levy has... <laughs> somehow by the tip of his fingernails clawed his way back into this one perhaps oh wow this is so heads up Raph is getting rid of the Skirk Prospector because the Prospector could sacrifice the Krenko and negate oh. the life gain on the Oath of Kaya Raph getting rid of this first guarantees that his Oath of Kaya will be able to remove the Krenko and gain the life so it, it, the potential pitfall in his plan he recognizes before walking into it and prevents it oh, Gothamation off the top for Li Shitian. Now, can Lee Shiten use something like Goblin Matron to get a, a, a Chieftain? Maybe? I, I believe a Chieftain is lethal here, as that would be 8 power coming on through with the block on Wall of Blossoms on Ringleader. Oh, and you see it on Raphael Levy's face. There are the GG's Goblin Matron getting the Chieftain. That is going to be exactly eight damage, and Li Shitian taking it down with goblins against Abs and Midrange. Oh, that was so tough for Raf. Just a really awkward early game, and almost stabilizing it, only to fall to a matron off the top. <laughs> 